Well, I guess I have the dubious distinction of being the last person before dinner, so thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, we're going to make kind of an abrupt transition and go back to the first couple talks of this session and talk about large-scale dynamics and linkages with cloud radiative processes over the Southern Ocean. And toward the end of my talk, I'll touch a little bit on how that might relate to climate sensitivity. So this is work that I did mainly with Lorenzo Pulvani when I was a postdoc at Columbia that I'm now continuing at UVA. I'd also like to thank John Fazulo, who has been helping us on the latter part of this work that I'll be showing you. Most of this work has been published in Journal of Climate this past summer, with the exception of the last couple of things that, like I said, is new stuff with John, John Fazulo. Okay, so many of you have probably seen this figure throughout the week um, in, in some way, shape, or form. And as Jen Kay made in a talk on Monday morning, uh, we think, at least uh, there's a community of us that think that this idea of the poleward shift of the storms that you see in this diagram may be a little bit misleading. And so the idea put forward in this IPCC chapter is that we know that with increasing greenhouse gases, we're going to expect the jet to move forward, particularly in the southern hemisphere. And as the jet moves forward, we expect most of the extratropical cyclones to move forward with the jet, and thus the reflection of the shortwave radiation to move forward with the cyclones. And so the idea is, is because those cyclonic clouds are moving from a lower latitude to a higher latitude, they'd by definition be reflecting less radiation. And so somehow this polar shift of the jet in a lot of models is linked to a positive cloud feedback. And hopefully by the end of my talk, I'll convince you that this sort of idea that this is robust is maybe not true, that there's a lot of spread across models in this particular process. And so really, we just had a very simple question. We just wanted to know in the Southern Hemisphere, does a polar jet shift produce a cloud radiative effect? And we're going to look at this not in terms of forcing yet. I'll, at the end of my talk, I'll talk about CO2 forcing. But for now, I just want to think about internal variability, so when the jet wobbles between a more poleward and equatorward position. And the idea being is that we can look in the pre-industrial control runs of the CMIT-5 models, so hundreds of years of unforced variability, and we can compare that to the kind of variability that we see in the observed satellite record to get a sense of you know, what kind of cloud radiative processes are tied to a jet shift. So for this talk, I'm going to focus only on the Southern Hemisphere summer when the incoming sunlight is maximized. We're going to define the jet using lower tropospheric winds and then regress the cloud radio effect anomalies onto the jet latitude time series. So this is a little bit different than what Dave Thompson showed in his talk earlier in the session in that we're not using this Southern annular mode. And the reason that we're using this jet index is that in each model, the SAM shifts the jet by slightly a different amount. And what we want to do is standardize all the models so that we're looking at a one degree jet shift in all the models. So we're basically comparing the same amount of jet shift in each model. So all the patterns that I'm going to be showing you are basically per one degree jet shift. So I'll be showing you a lot of plots like this. These are short wave cloud radiative effect anomalies for a one degree polar jet shift. These are in 10 CMIT-5 models. And so by construction, again, the jet moves forward by one degree in each of these panels due to internal variability. But what you can see is that with the jet shift, we get this big sort of red annulus region, this shortwave cloud radiative warming effect existing in these 10 models. And so this is consistent with what the IPCC is arguing in a future climate, that when the jet moves further forward, we reduce the total cloud fraction at southern hemisphere mid-latitudes, and it gives us this shortwave cloud radiative warming effect. And so this figure is not surprising. It's consistent with what's been argued in the IPCC report. But if you delve into this deeper and you look at more CMIT-5 models, what you'll find is that not all of the models behave like this. In other models, you'll see that it's basically a messy pattern, very banded structures. And actually, if you integrate over the southern hemisphere mid-latitudes, it actually contributes to somewhat of a net cooling effect. And so that's how we've separated these models. We call these, just for simplicity, type 1. They contribute to a net warming effect. These are type 2. They contribute to a net cooling effect. And so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to just be averaging these, these models and, and referring to them as type 1 and type 2. So these are the composites, shortwave cloud radio effect composites for a one degree polar jet shift. 
This is the same thing that I showed you on the previous slide for those 20 models, but now we've averaged them over type 1 and type 2. And it's exactly what I said is that in the type 1 models, you get this big warming effect with a jet shift that really doesn't exist in these type 2 models. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at the long wave cloud radio effects, which is basically the high cloud behavior, is that all of the models that we looked at really do about the same thing. And so they all give you sort of this tripolar pattern with a poleward shift of the high clouds with the jet. And so all of the models are doing the same thing in terms of the long wave. It seems to be the short wave and presumably the low clouds, a lot of the microphysical things that we've heard in this section that probably contribute to that. So the question we need to ask now is we have this interesting sort of differences in model behavior. What, how does that compare with the observations? And so the first point I'll make is that this is from the pre-industrial control. If we make it from the historical runs, these same figures in the models, we get almost the same thing. So it's okay to compare these pre-industrial figures with the historical period from the observations. So what I'm going to do in the observations is regress satellite observations from ISKIP FD and Ceres, the cloud radiative effects, onto the air interim jet latitude. So we're doing the same thing in the observations as we did in the model. And so in the long wave part of the spectrum, what you see is that really the observations in the models agree very well. And so obviously the observations are messy. We have a shorter data record than we do in the models. But in, in a general sense, there's large agreement across the long wave part of the spectrum. And so the models seem to be doing roughly the same thing as the observations are doing. The interesting thing is really what's going on here in the short wave, is that in the short wave part of the spectrum, in the satellite observations, the cloud radiative effect does not show this zonally, zonally symmetric warming effect that we get with a polar jet shift in these type 1 models. And I'd argue that actually, if you look at the regional structures here, it actually agrees pretty well with what the type 2 models are, are showing. And so this, there's some evidence, at least, that, that the type 2 models are more realistic in terms of this process. Now, you might argue that this is a short data, data record in the observations, and then if we had 100 years of observational record, maybe we would get this signal. It's possible, but at least in the record that we have, it seems to suggest that these type 2 models are more realistic. Now, maybe the type 2 models just simply have better clouds. Um, and the point I, I don't want to come out in this talk and say that the type 2 models are better. Both classes of models have their strengths and their weaknesses. And I think it's helpful to look at that on this figure. So if we look at the climatology, so this is the top panel here is the series shortwave cloud radiative effect climatology over the historical record. These are, this is the historical climatology from the type 1 models and then of the type 2. And so what you see this, the type 1 models get the right magnitude of the cloud reflection they get the right, basically the amount of clouds over the Southern Ocean and the reflectivity correct, but you'll notice how zonally symmetric this is compared to the observations. If you look at the type two models, you'll notice that they severely underestimate the cloud reflection, but a lot of the structures, you see this maximum there and there, and you can compare it up here, and if you look up into the subtropics, they're also doing a better job when compared with the observations. And so there seems to be a trade-off here between magnitude and structure, and in terms of this jet cloud coupling issue, it seems to be that the structure argument wins the day. So thus far, we've just looked at interannual variability, and we found these two classes of models. And so it seems to be that the behavior of these type 2 models is more realistic. Regardless, we can ask that there's this two, two classes of model behavior. It has to have some relevance in a future climate scenario when we know the jet is going to shift. And so what are the implications of this, and in particular for climate sensitivity? So the first thing that we did is we looked at this um, in the abrupt quadrupling runs of the CMIP-5 archive, in which they quadruple CO2 at the beginning of a 150-year-long run. And so what they find, what we found in these runs is, so this is global mean surface temperature as a function of time, and this is a logarithmic axis. And the reason I'm showing this is that the only difference that you see between these two classes of models occurs initially in like the first couple decades. And so what happens here is that in these idealized runs, some component of the jet shift occurs rapidly before really the sea surface temperatures can respond. And so associated with that jet shift, you see this distinction in this cloud radiative warming effect. And so there's a slight 
slightly higher increase in global mean surface temperature in these models over, say, the first couple decades. But by the time you run this out to climate sensitivity and you have to factor in things like warming climate changes the microphysics of clouds and these type of things, suddenly then there's no distinction between these two classes of models. Now, as we were thinking about this result, so this is where we left our general climate paper. And as we were thinking about this result, we decided that this result seemed to be inconsistent with some work that was published by Trenberth and Vizzullo that you, many of you are probably aware of based on the CMIP-3 models. And so what they found in their paper based on the CMIP-3 models is that basically the net radiation bias in the southern hemisphere, so the net radiation absorbed, was strongly linked with what the climate sensitivity was in the model. And so the observed range of net radiation absorbed is in this gray band here. And so what they found is that only the models in their present day climatology that had the highest climate sensitivities had the most reasonable values of net radiation absorbed. And so you'll hear this often referred to as this emergent constraint on climate sensitivity. So we tried to reproduce this plot using the CMIP-5 models. And what you get here is that the relationship largely goes away uh, in these CMIP-5 models. In fact, if you take away like that model there, there's basically no correlation. And so say, just for fun, we're going to colorize these by the type 1 and type 2 behavior. And so you'll see two interesting things here. The first thing you'll see is that almost all of the CMIP-3 models fell into this type 1 category. And then in the CMIP-5, they're more evenly distributed between this type 1 and type 2 behavior. And to me, this is more evidence that as we improve our microphysical th schemes and cloud parameterizations in these models, this type 1 behavior seems to be going away. There seems to be more of this type 2 behavior. And so that's more evidence to me that maybe the type 2 models are correct in terms of this process. The other interesting thing, as you probably noted, is that the relationship that Trenberth and Fazuo noted doesn't go away in CMIP-5 models. It only exists in these so-called type 1 models. And you can see that the red models here have a very strong correlation, just like they did in the CMIP-3 archive. And so what seems to be happening here is that basically, let's consider this model here. That model has very bright clouds. And so when the jet shifts, all those clouds dissipate, and so you get this big warming effect. And then this model up here doesn't have as many clouds, so when the jet shift, you don't get as big of a warming effect. And so this type 1 model behavior seems to be tied in some way, shape, or form to the climate sensitivity. Now, that's not the only thing going on. The Southern Ocean isn't the only thing going on in these models. There's differences in, say, the subtropics and the tropics, but it's interesting, nonetheless, that this behavior is some sort of a, maybe a litmus test for this emergent constraint existing in, in these models. Okay. So I found two classes of CMIP-5 models, one in which there's a strong coupling between the jet and, and, and cloud movement, and one in which there really isn't. And it seems to be that the type 2 models are more realistic. And so I showed you lastly that the biases in this jet cloud coupling may be linked to this relationship of climate sensitivity that was noted in the CMIP-3 models. And so that's something that we're looking at right now, and I'd be happy to discuss with people afterwards uh, about further details about that. So thanks, everyone, for staying uh, past 6 o'clock. Any questions for our speaker? Thank you all for attending this session. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, there uh, is an uh, effort going forward called Socrates to, to get some of these measurements that we've heard uh, calls for today. So uh, if you're not aware of that and would like to learn more, uh, please do come talk to me. I tell you to go look at my poster, but cleverly they put the poster session before the oral, so I, I can't quite do that. But anyway, thank you for coming.